much um, just for hosting me this evening. It was quite a, an interesting um, invitation, seeing as I'm not a conservationist per se, but I, I suppose I see myself as a, a health conservationist, if I can put it that way. Um, and it's a great privilege to be in such great company tonight. I must say everyone um, from all over Africa, possibly all over the world and yeah just everything that everyone seems to be doing to uplift our local and global community it's really important um, and I'm a very big advocate of public education and specifically health education so the work that I do for SASM um, which is really about bringing integrative medicine and the approach thereof to just the general public, um, but spe specifically South Africa and Africa, because it is very well known overseas. Um, you know, you hear of all those fancy clinics in Mexico where they're doing all kinds of weird things and Switzerland and this and that. Um, this is to show people that there is actually a more accessible and readily um, approachable way to healing naturally without drugs um, and surgery. So that's really going to be a little bit of uh, information for tonight um, I wanted this evening to be more of a gift to the viewers so it's really not about as I said about conservation per se but it is something for you to take home with you this evening and if you maybe you know something hits home for you or you maybe click on one of the suggested um, apps or podcasts that I've got for you at the end of this talk it could potentially be life-changing um, and it really is special that um, I think people learn about their own bodies and small things that you can do on a daily basis to help you deal with stress. Because at the end of the day, I believe that we have moved so far away from nature that we're in a very unnatural state and that puts us under stress. So we'll be covering a little bit about uh, sort of my views of stress. Um, and yeah, I'd just like to invite all of you to sit back, relax. This is not an academic talk. Um, it's very sort of simple and basic. And without further ado, let's get to it. Okay. So I'd like to discuss a case. Um, one of my very first patients came in with high blood pressure. So he was actually a farmer from the local area. And I'm not sure if the rest of you know, but Hermanus is very well known for its wine making and wine production so he's a wine farmer and you know sort of the typical I want to say staunch Afrikaans um, very conservative seeming to me and he had high blood pressure and cholesterol and he sat down in front of me and I, I sort of looked very confused I thought do you know where you are <laughs> I'm not a normal GP but I didn't say anything and he sat down and he said doc I really just want to get off of these pills. And he just unpacked this bag of tablets that he was taking. And I looked at him and I said, are you sure? Um, he said, yeah, no, absolutely. It's, it can't be good for me. And I was just so amazed um, that someone seemingly so sort of conservative was asking me to do something that is very much against the mainstream idea of what um, doctoring is about. And so we went on a journey together where he, you know, he's been my patient for many years now. And we did breathing exercises together where I would take his blood pressure um, before any exercises and it would be sky high. We would do one breathing exercise and the blood pressure would come down by like 10 points on either side. And that just blew his mind. So that sort of gained, gained my, his, um, I gained his trust through that. And yeah, slowly but surely I got his wife in. We started changing the way that they were eating, um, you know, from the rice place and octopus, the meat, rice and potatoes regime. We started introducing a little bit of green veggies. Um, he had a little shot of apple cider vinegar in the morning before his coffee. Um, decreasing wine. That was a really tricky one, obviously. Um, but yeah, slowly but surely he started stopping all of his pills and today he actually doesn't have any chronic diseases we had to change his medical aid plan um, so he's healed himself from previously having been a patient with very high risk for heart disease and stroke he's actually brought his risk profile down to low risk 
just with these natural interventions and a little bit every day and having the courage to try something new has actually changed his life. And so subsequently, you know, his wife is my patient, his daughter, his son. I mean, their family members fly from all over um, for holidays and they come see me as well. So it really is a wonderful journey that um, anyone can actually undertake. And you don't need to see uh, a specialist for this. I believe that any GP should actually start using these approaches. Um, also, if you do want to do a little bit of self-education, there are a lot of amazing podcasts and books, and it's just such a wonderfully um, rapidly growing movement. Um, so yeah, hopefully this is not the first for some of you. If it is, then I hope this is gonna be a wonderful introduction. My objectives for tonight, um, understanding the effects of chronic stress on wellness, um, I'm going to do an introduction to integrative healing um, as a speciality um, of medicine and of, of wellness uh, therapies, uh, fresh perspective on stress, so just uh, getting a, a bit of a different view on what stress is maybe doing to your body, um, optimizing wellness, a couple of practical steps of where we can start to bring our bodies into balance, leaky gut and leaky brain, I'll talk a bit more more about that. It's a very hot topic at the moment, um, as well as hormones and wellness and how your hormones are actually um, so integral and very sensitive to stress. And then we'll go through some tools for self-healing that you can take um, that are safe for anybody to try um, as a starting point until you reach a point where maybe you want to go and see an integrative or functional medical practitioner. And then I've got some follow-up info that you can perhaps start this journey in your own time. Okay, so I've mentioned a little bit about what integrative medicine is, but it's really an approach to healing. Um, if I can sort of juxtapose that against the Western, um, what we call allopathic medical system, which is where we give pharmaceutical drugs and surgery for most problems. I mean, that's usually what you get when you go to the doctor um, or a surgeon, obviously, that is the most common mainstream healing modality that we know here. Um, and then you've got the complete opposite, which, which is the well, opposite, um, the alternative um, healing modalities such as homeopathy and reflexology and acupuncture. So they're actually completely on opposite sides which is interesting. And what integrative medicine is doing is we're trying to integrate the two. So I am a medical doctor. I do have all of the years of training and experience. I've done surgery. And there was just a point um, where I realized, you know, in my career that something was off about this picture. Something just wasn't making sense um, when I was looking at patients with chronic disease. And patients, I, I, I spent a lot of years in the ER and patients coming back again and again and again and just getting more and more and more pulse. And it was through my own healing journey that I actually um, had a burnout after many years in the ER and met an integrative practitioner who then helped me help myself back to health. And it actually changed my whole life when I decided to specialize in integrative medicine. So as you can see, we believe in treating the root cause of your disease. And you can see even the way I've spelled that word is meaningful. It's actually dis-ease. You know, disease is not something that's just a label that you give yourself when you walk around with this big, heavy label. It's the understanding that it is just as, as a result of an imbalance. Um, so we treat the root cause, not the symptoms or the results. So I don't look at an X-ray and say, I'm treating that. I'm treating you, the person sitting in front of me. Um, we establish a therapeutic partnership with you. Um, and it's a bit of a different paradigm because as an integrative facilitator, you know, I don't even like calling myself a doctor always. I know it's a little bit like scary for people because um, they, they almost feel more safe if you call yourself a doctor, but I don't heal you. I will give you tools to, so that you can heal yourself and an understanding of your body um, and some guidance that, that you can actually use to heal yourself. And remember, this is for chronic disease, okay? I'm not talking about a broken bone. Then you must go to the ER. <laughs> 
Um, so it's also teaching you to take responsibility for your own health and wellness. Um, we do individualize tests, protocols, and treatments. So every single person gets a, a different approach. Um, it's not going on your symptoms. We actually listen to you and then we try and figure out a plan together. And we use natural medicines and alternative healing modalities as far as possible to avoid using unnecessary chemical drugs or surgery. So that might include herbal products. Some, pay, some doctors prefer um, Chinese herbs. Some you know, use Indian herbs, some use indigenous local herbs, which I love using as well, like your mpepu, um, you know, there's just so many, our, our local buhu, our cancer bush, um, you know, so, so, such a wonderful variety of our indigenous herbs that I love growing. I grow them outside my practice and patients can come and pick the herbs and we teach them how to use and grow those. Um, and then obviously there might come a time where we need to use drugs or we need to opt for an operation. But pretty much nine times out of 10, we can actually save that um, invasive and, and potentially harmful process for patients, which is really, really great. I believe that we're at the forefront of advances in medical technology and the latest studies. Um, we love staying up to date with everything. And I do believe that we are, um, as integrative medical practitioners, the future of medicine for treating chronic disease. We cannot continue uh, on this path of just giving people a pill and enabling them to still eat whatever they want, drink whatever they want, not exercise, um, and also just, just uh, remove, be so far removed from nature. And by that, I mean far removed from themselves as well. So here's a quote that I quite love. Um, the human body has been designed to resist an infinite number of changes and attacks brought about by its environment. The secret of good health lies in successful adjustment to changing stresses on the body. So this brings me to something that I firmly believe, and that is we are natural beings. You know, we are basically animals, you know, um, part of our environment and, um, you know, with a higher consciousness, obviously, and we are being subjected to a vastly unnatural amount of stresses in the form of toxins, heavy metals, pollution, uh, social media stresses, so all the, those social and emotional stresses, electromagnetic frequencies, I mean, the list goes on and on. And the body simply isn't designed to actually deal with those unless we can optimize the functions of the body. So we'll be touching a bit on that. All right, so everyone knows stress sucks. <laughs> I just want everyone to just get a better understanding of why and the way that I see it is that it can lead to an imbalance in the mind and the body. And it's often at the root cause of commonly diagnosed conditions, um, such as the ones that I've mentioned. And what many people don't know is that the studies that are being done actually prove that stress leads to increased inflammation, which is at the root cause of a lot of chronic diseases. Um, we'll get to more specific mechanisms and physiology, physiology now. Um, it can essentially lead to poor quality of life, shortened lifespan, and it really isn't worth the price at the end of the day. This is what I hear a lot of my patients telling me when they're lying, um, you know, some of them on their deathbeds and they're saying, but you know, gosh, <laughs> it just wasn't worth it. And I'm in the privilege of dealing with a lot of patients uh, crossing over, so I do palliative care as well. And that must be one sentiment, if I can share that just um, sort of off the cuff, is that all that hard work and setting the goals, I want to say, out of touch with nature and out of touch with what really matters causes a lot of stress for people, and it just isn't worth it. So... Typically, we look at different types of stress. We've got physical stress, um, which can be, you know, anything from this list. Injury, people often underestimate the effects of surgery, for instance. Um, intense work, so that can be physical or mental. Um, and then the environmental pollution I have touched on. Um, I know, for example, here we've got the agricultural sector that is taking over vast amounts of, of natural um, fainbos and sort of replacing that with um, well grapes and all these things uh, which are heavily sprayed 
And those toxins enter into the, the water tables and they float around the valley. And so my patients come in with a lot of hectic sinusitis issues. Um, it also can spark autoimmune food allergies and sensitivities. Illnesses. So for example, COVID, we've just been through this crazy pandemic. Um, you know, we, we all know how we feel after a normal viral kind of infection, but what about one after the other after the other? Um, dietary stress, so this is sort of depriving your body of valuable nu nutrition. Um, so stopping off at the McDonald's on the way home, or just quickly getting that chocolate for a quick energy fix, or that first cup of coffee at the end of the day is actually putting a lot of stress on your body. Um, mild dehydration, because a lot of us just aren't drinking enough water. Um, substance abuse, so that can also be in the form of coffee, sugar, alcohol, and obviously recreational drugs, which are often used to sort of de-stress. And I think, you know, unfortunately we are in a culture, especially in South Africa, I can't speak for the rest of Africa at this point, but you know, everyone makes it so okay to unwind using alcohol. And at the beginning, when I was introduced, um, before everyone arrived, I said, oh, I would just love to be in front of the fire now with a glass of red wine. And the truth of the matter is, you know, that's just sort of what we do. But some people really do go overboard. And it's about finding that balance, um, which is where I'm quite passionate. So as Johan said, it's going to be, it has to be yummy. It has to be lucky, but we're going to do it in moderation. Okay. And then um, misalignments of the body. Um, so that's things like your spinal alignment. We sit at the computer a lot, the um, angle of your neck ergonomics, so how you're sitting at your desk, is your chair the right height? Can it maybe be set to balance your elbows nicely so that you have good support for your spine? Um, these sort of uh, small tips add up at the end of the day. Psychological stress, I'm sure everyone is familiar with this. This is sort of fun self and as they say, it's sort of obvious. Um, emotional stress, uh, this is often interpersonal, it can also be um, perceptual, which means that we can um, perseverate, so we can exaggerate certain fears, um, certain frustrations and certain so-called triggers, as the psychologists would say, um, that can call us emotional stress. Um, cognitive stress, I think most of us probably suffer from just because the level of functioning is so unnaturally high. Um, in terms of just what we expected to do, performance work-wise, um, performance socially, et cetera. So information overload, um, worry, guilt, am I not good enough? Gosh, why, do they, why did they get the raise, not me? You know, all these different types of critical thoughts um, and self-talk that, um, you know, all these buzzwords are going around, which I'm really happy about because they actually do cause a lot of stress um, and that can affect our actual body, our physiology. Um, a lot of us suffer from anxiety, a lot of my patients do, um, which can lead to quite severe effects, panic attacks, and it can feel like you're sort of floating above your body, um, feeling dissociated or um, detached from the world. And especially during COVID with isolation, vast amounts of people are now suffering from anxiety, um, just because of the state of the world, I think you guys deal a lot with that in terms of um, just ecology and conservation. Um, and then perceptual stresses are, again, our beliefs, the stories we tell ourselves, the attitudes that we have in the worldview. Just briefly, psychosocial stress, obviously, within your relationships, marriages, etc., lack of social support, um, a lot of financial stress going around after COVID especially. Um, and then psychospiritual, which is sort of like an existential crisis that you can have. You can be in a job that you used to like 10 years ago, and now you absolutely hate and you're just feeling sort of lost, unsatisfied, and you're just going on autopilot, you know, and these sorts of feelings really do build up and they can cause a serious detriment to your body. So chronic stress is when the body or mind is put in a challenging, uh, whether it's real or imagined, I want to say perceived situation for extended periods of time. So we all know that stress can actually be quite beneficial, especially if you need to get a job done, if you need to sort of uh, run away from a, a leopard when you're at the Kruger, if you're lucky enough to see. <laughs> Maybe that's not a good example, a lion is probably more common. 
Um, but it has an effect on the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve is a nerve that runs from the skull all the way down, um, sort of in two branches throughout the spine. Um, and it has various roots and it actually supplies many organ systems. Um, the main one that I'm going to focus on tonight is the gut. But when we are in this chronic state of fight or flight, um, the vagus nerve tends to be more in a sympathetic overdrive. So it actually causes a shift in blood flow to um, the muscles, to the eyes, so we can see clearly, you know, because we're ready to like fight or run away. And the blood flow isn't actually prioritized to the gut. So we'll be covering that shortly. Um, and if we don't take time to reset that um, part of your nervous system, which we call rest and recover or rest and digest, you may end up having this accumulation of chronic stress, which will really um, impact your body. We're going to unpack that now. Um, and then just as I've said, you know, the body and mind can only take so much. Red flags start to appear. And that's what modern medicine calls symptoms or disease. But I just see it as a messenger that is telling you to take it easy and unwind more often. I'd like to invite everyone just to do a quick breathing exercise with me, just as a little bit of an energizer. So if you can just sit with your feet sort of hip distance apart, um, back up straight in your chair, this will only be a few moments. And lay your hands on your thighs, on your knees. You can gently close your eyes. And I'm going to ask you to just connect with your body, just humor me. It's really a, a wonderful sort of reset for your nervous system. So you can see in your mind's eye, maybe you can feel your heartbeat. You can sense a certain ripple of electricity or current through your body. Maybe you notice your mind is rushing and you're thinking, oh, this is such a waste of time. Or maybe you're thinking, oh, wow, it feels so good just to, just to be still for a moment. And I want you to memorize how you're feeling at the moment, right now. I'm going to do a quick breathing exercise, and then you're going to see how you feel afterwards. So I call this, this breathing exercise in, in, out. It's really nothing fancy. Um, so we're going to take a full breath in, another full breath on top of that. So almost like you can't go anymore. Hold for two seconds, and you're going to breathe out through your mouth. So try and breathe in through your nose. So... Okay, so keep your eyes closed. All right, so here we go. Two more. And really let go. Keep your eyes closed and just notice what's, what's shifted in your body. Maybe you feel like you can take a big breath for the first time today. Maybe you feel a little bit energized. Maybe you've got a smile on your face. Uh, this is one of the techniques that I teach my patients when we're starting out. And at any point in the day, this is actually a complete reset for your nervous system, for your brain body connection and it brings you closer to yourself um, which means that you're more likely to make better decisions for your health and well-being you're more likely to um, notice that you're thirsty and drink more water you're more likely to not um, have sugar and salt cravings and actually choose foods that are going to nourish you and you're more likely to go to bed when you're actually tired you know or say no sorry i don't have capacity to do this favor for you today if you're doing those regular check-ins um, the physiological benefits of these breathing exercises have been proven to decrease blood pressure to decrease um, stress hormones such as adrenaline and cortisol which can have a, um, a very wonderfully soothing effect on your hormones and on your mental health Okay, so let's talk about optimizing wellness. I hope everyone is still with me and awake. I just want to check the time. 
Okay, awesome. So basically what we um, are aiming for is not just feeling symptom-free. I want you to feel amazing. I want you to feel optimal. And I think a lot of people don't even realize that they're not functioning at optimal until you're actually feeling what it, what it feels like. So there are different um, sort of basic uh, steps that one can take. And I like to work in phases. So we usually do phase one. And there's three phases. Phase one is back to basics, back to nature. So we do things like um, getting the body feeling safe, which helps the mind feel more at peace. It, it just obviously makes sense to me that if you're doing um, things to nourish your body um, and your cells are happy, you've got enough vitamins and minerals running around in your body, you've got enough energy from good fats, um, you've got nice movement through the body, healthy movement, um, that the monkey mind that is always sort of on the go is actually going to be a lot easier to switch off, um, not control, but just to find some peace in your day. So we focus on food as medicine. This is one of the three pillars. So it's food as medicine where we boost your nutrition, detox the body system, lower the acidity in the body. And by that, I mean the acidity um, sort of in between the cells. So in the fluid between the cells, you can have either an acidic type of body due to um, mild dehydration, chronic stress, certain foods that you're eating. And that actually causes the cells to close up because obviously if I was surrounded by acid, I would also not want to um, let anything in or out. I would be under lockdown, you know, in, in, in that sense, if I can use that metaphor. And so when we start to alkalize the body and flush out acids, um, you know, obviously using a lot of hydration and lovely nutritional foods, the cells of the body start to feel safer and they actually start to release toxins and invite in vital nutrients. So a lot of people, even though they are eating the most beautiful, pristine diets, um, they are maybe plant-based, they're having thousands of rands worth of supplements a day, but because they're chronically stressed, they're not actually absorbing anything or not nearly as much as they should be. Okay, so movement as medicine is the second pillar. Um, so then we look at a little bit of a shift in um, the usual doctor prescribed exercise. So usually doctors will say, are you doing cardio? Are you doing weights? Um, you know, which obviously are important, but we look at um, a bit of a deeper understanding of how specific movements, um, which come from the ancient times, such as Tai Chi, yoga, um, Qigong specifically, certain dancing um, movements, are actually recently have been proven to work on the spine to uh, balance out the vagus nerve system, which I was talking about. And they can actually instantly de-stress you and that can last for many hours throughout your day or week. Um, and then certain adaptive exercises such as Pilates, which combine a little bit of modern day with the ancient modalities. And I like the ancient modalities um, that I've just mentioned because they are based on nature once again you know they they the tai chi masters um which is a martial art um coming from the eastern uh, from the, the middle east they used to look at how animals move and they noticed that there was this rhythm from the spine and animals can actually reset their nervous system if you look at um sort of in context maybe if you're sitting at a watering hole and you're looking at the animals coming there and you see this lion or you know predator stalking a buck and they chase they chase the buck and they miss it and the buck comes back eventually and it does like this little shake because like Brrr. and that's actually the animal's ability to reset its nervous system but as humans we don't have that so it's imperative for us to take um active steps throughout our day to actually force ourselves to do that because we've lost that ability unfortunately and then the third pillar is mindfulness as medicine. So where we use evidence-based breathing techniques, meditation, um, and various other techniques to help calm the mind, which also calms the inflammation in the body. It helps the body digest food better. 
Um, and so that might include journaling, mindful eating, which means eating without uh, television or you know, just quietly sitting by yourself and actually enjoying the food in front of you, um, appreciating what it looks like, what it smells like, you know, um, saying your gratitude for the meal, um, etc. So these practices come from, you know, thousands of years, but now we understand why they actually have been incorporated into our culture. Um, and then the daily check-ins we've discussed. Um, I always say, you know, all of this can be quite overwhelming. It's a lot to consider, but just start with one thing. If you look at this list of examples, you know, what stood out for you out of all of these um, modalities? Just choose one thing, research it, try it for a month and see how you feel. Okay, so we all know Hippocrates um, and he said that all disease starts in the gut. So I would like to just briefly touch on leaky guts. I'm not sure if um, you have heard anything about this. It's also a very hot topic at the moment. Um, so leaky gut is when the gut starts to have microscopic holes that form. So that's the tube basically from the mouth all the way through to the stomach, the small intestine, which I call the long road to freedom. And then we've got the colon um, and then obviously the the external exit. Um, and so we want that tube to be a solid tube. We don't really don't want um, what's in, inside that tube to be leaking out. But unfortunately, with the stress hormones chronically out of balance and certain toxins in our food, such as gluten, and some people have dairy intolerances, um, excessive alcohol, etc., we actually do find that microscopic holes start to form because the cement that keeps the cells together starts to pull away. And so there's leaking out of enzymes, proteins, bacteria, parasites, um, which can cause a lot of pressure on your system. So some symptoms, you might recognize some of these in yourself or those that you, maybe your loved ones, um, stomach cramps after eating specifically, bloating, symptoms of high inflammation. So a lot of people experience stiff joints and muscles. Some people gain weight, lose weight, um, you know, a lot of my, my patients, especially the females, they come in and say, I've just gained so much weight despite basically eating nothing and over-exercising. I just don't understand it. And, you know, that comes back down to stress. You're putting your body under even more stress. So it's holding on to fat as a protective mechanism. Um, constipation or diarrhea are very common. Cravings for sugar and carbs. So that could be leaky gut. Skin reactions, so we've got all kinds of rashes from acne in teenagers or eczema, psoriasis, etc. Brain fog and fatigue. So this is basically an umbrella, um, low energy, poor concentration, poor memory, low mood, poor sleep. Um, so it's a massive uh, collection of symptoms that can actually be due to leaky gut. So just a little bit more specifics on what can cause leaky gut, um, specific foods. So even if you're not allergic to these foods, um, as in, you know, if we had to do an allergy test for gluten or for lactose or, you know, soya or corn, or all these sorts of things. For me, it's actually about the fact that these foods are not being produced naturally anymore. They are being sprayed heavily with chemicals um, just before ripening. So specifically wheat, corn, soya um, are sprayed with Roundup, which is a um, terrible chemical that kills all of the, or most of the gut bugs that we really need to help us be healthy. So um, it's incredibly detrimental. It's almost like you're taking a type of antibiotic when you're eating excessive amounts of these foods, specifically gluten. I'm very passionate about cutting out gluten for a month or three and seeing if that actually helps your symptoms. Um, dairy, specifically because of the antibiotics that they add into the cow's milk and a bunch of other chemicals and horrible things that we've seen now in the abuse of, of cows in the dairy industry. Um, excess alcohol consumption, we've covered more or less sugar containing foods and a lot of people don't know how to read labels properly. So um, that's worth looking into. So a lot of um, people are marketing foods as sugar-free, but then they actually contain glucose syrup, 
um, for example. And so it's just different names for sugar. So it's, it's very valuable to actually read the label properly. Excessive coffee intake. Gosh, I think coffee is probably the hardest drug for me to get people off of. <laughs> um, but the coffee does really cause uh, difficulty in absorption of the gut. So that can cause all kinds of malabsorption um, symptoms. Um, and it also maxes out the adrenal. So it's like putting your foot on the, on the fuel uh, of, a, of, of an empty tank, um, so to speak. So a lot of my patients do feel quite good stopping coffee for a while. Processed foods, you know, that's, that's sort of a no-brainer. But I think also just, again, the codes of the ingredients and bad fats. That's mostly in your junk food um, where we have those horrible processed oils, which are very dangerous um, for leaky gut and for cancer as well. Okay, so you're probably wondering where to start. <laughs> um, you guys will have access to these slides, by the way. Um, I will put them on for free, uh, just as a PDF on my website, and I'll get the guys just to share exactly where to get hold of this if you are interested. Um, so first of all, we need to remove the foods and the factors that are damaging the gut. Um, what I like to do in my protocols is inspire patients. So I don't just take something away, I give you a substitute um, that's just as sort of, I want to say, sexy as, the, as what you were used to, you know, so we don't just take away milk, we'll replace it with maybe an affordable local nut milk, or maybe goat's milk products, goat's milk cheeses, um, gluten free, you know, we often replace um, wheat products with uh, like brown rice or lentils. Um, specific mung beans and things like that that are quite affordable and easy to prepare. Um, so we replace these, as I've said, and an anti-inflammatory leaky gut diet, essentially we, we're just feeding the good gut microbiome, like if you wanted to reconstitute um, an area that, that you need to sort of regrow in terms of conservation. You have to feed the soil again. You have to replant um, a lot of the support, I want to say supporting um, flora and fauna needs to come into, into play. So we feed the, our little gut bugs in our gut with lots of good veggies and fiber and good fats. Um, and then we can give specific supplements such as L-glutamine, vitamin D, 5-HTP, which boosts the serotonin in the guts, which is very, very helpful. Then we add in extra probiotics which you can do with um, supplements, but I'm very much a big fan of fermented foods. Um, and basically what this does is it boosts the barrier inside the gut. So if you think about it, it's sort of like a mucosal lining that's got a couple of different layers that are actually there to protect you. And when the gut starts to leak, you're actually losing your, your protection from all kinds of, of nasty things. Um, and I think that's why a lot of people are getting sick a lot of the time and um, we're getting just a lot of patients that are chronically ill, chronically tired, because you're fighting off a lot of these um, uh, negative influences. Um, so the gut microbiota, they are your friends, they regulate digestion, they help us to absorb nutrients, they also um, can prevent certain genes from being switched on, so that's epigenetics, um, that's going into a little bit of detail, but they can switch off inflammatory um, genes that can lead to cancer and certain chronic diseases, um, even genes, diabetic genes, all kinds of things. So amazing research that's going into that. And bone broth. <laughs> bone broth is miraculous. Um, my mom is actually making bone broth for my patients uh, just because we can't seem to keep up. And something so simple that you can make at home, just using um, the bones of like, chicken that you've eaten, preferably free range, um, grass fed beef bones, venison bones that you roast in the oven and you reduce them in a pot with water and a bunch of uh, natural herbs, maybe a carrot and an onion. And you reduce that broth and it actually is the most beautiful gut healing medicine that you can make easily. It's super affordable. And if you have that for a month or two, I mean, I've had patients heal their arthritis um, just from following these basic steps um, with what they had at their disposal. Um, so it's really wonderful. Okay. What should I eat? Now we've gone through everything you can't eat. <laughs> Let's give you some options. 
loads of veggies we've said veggies anyway preferably not too many raw veggies so just add in veggies to what you are already eating fermented foods like kimchi kefir um, mass is also a very popular one um, which is like a fermented milk culture culture buttermilk is also good sprouted seeds very easy to do at home very affordable um, foods rich in uh, good fats so omega-3 specifically salmon and wild caught fish we don't all have access to that so you can do um, flax seeds their herbs and spices so I just add loads of all kinds of herbs and spices to pretty much everything and that is medicinal you know it has beautiful anti-inflammatory effects um, that are, have been proven so cooking with garlic chili uh, chili ginger are all wonderful um, natural anti-inflammatories um, and then I, so I've mentioned the grass-fed beef, lamb, organic veggies as far as you can. If you can't do that, just rinse your veggies nicely. Um, yeah, apple cider vinegar is the old, old wives' tale that actually works wonders. I find that a lot of people um, can afford that and it's maybe it doesn't always taste as good, but it works wonders for balancing out the gut. So that's another one to consider. Okay, so we talked about the gut microbiome, the effect of stress on the body and on the gut. Um, this is sort of a bottom-up approach. So if we're looking at helping the body to detoxify from all of these unnatural um, stressors on the body, um, it can actually be easier than you think. It doesn't necessarily look like a juice fast or anything uh, quite as intense as that. But essentially, these are some tips that you can take away. So to start the day with a green health smoothie or a veggie juice, um, some people also just use like a green veggie powder. Like if you're out in the bush and you can't maybe get fresh veggies. Drink enough water. 70% of your plate should be veggies. Um, I know it is difficult, but it is possible. Um, and if you're doing that, you know that you really are just nourishing your body in the way that you actually need. And then 20%, we've got the good, safe protein and, and some good fats as well. And then we've got some non-processed starch for 10%. So I think for a lot of people's plates, maybe your plate looks completely the opposite, where 10% is veggies. Just maybe give that a little bit of thought. Um, herbal teas instead of coffee. So we've got the lovely rooibos tea, green teas, buhu tea. Um, you can do just like mint tea, ginger tea, um, which are as invigorating, you know, in a different way to coffee. Um, supportive supplements, which we'll cover shortly. I'll give you a little list of my favorite supplements that I like to use um, just starting out um, and help your gut to stay regular. So in other words, try to make sure that you're going to the loo at least once a day, once to twice a day. Um, anything less than that is actually sort of our borderline constipation. So you might want to increase a bit of fiber in your diet. And you can use psyllium husks for that. It's very good. Um, but yeah, just increasing your veggies and your hydration should really help with that. And then we've got different detox organs. So it's also, again, trying to educate you in terms of what your body is capable of and the various functions of your body. Um, the liver. Everyone knows about the liver. It's probably the most well-known detox organ, specifically alcohol. Everyone always thinks alcohol. But it's actually, you know, it, it's detoxifying viral particles, bacterial particles, hormonal byproducts. Um, it's such a valuable organ for so many reasons. And there's different ways that we can detoxify the liver, um, but preferably with the guidance of a, a you know, practitioner who knows what they're doing. Kidneys, um, you know, staying hydrated, celery juice, herbal teas. Also, please be careful, not in excess again consult your practitioner here. Skin is a lovely one. So dry brushing is like a nice bamboo brush or um, any natural fiber. Plus um, your self massage. So a lot of cultures do lovely oils and you just massage the skin, um, ocean swims or you know, in any body of water. Sauna is also great for that. And then lungs, breathing exercises, don't smoke, exercise, very important. We actually release so many toxins through the lungs. Um, I have a lot of my patients who start to do a detox of sorts. And um, as I said, a detox can literally mean just adding more veggies. It's not like a juice fast or anything crazy. 
Um, it depends on what you need. But some patients have got a bit of a detox reaction, which can mean like a withdrawal response from coffee or something. And I just introduce the breathing exercises and they get better. The headache goes away. They suddenly have more energy. And it's because the lungs are actually releasing so many toxins. The colon I've just touched on. So try and stay regular as far as possible. Um, and then the lymphatic system is very important. So again, your yoga, swimming, walking, pretty much any movement. Um, massage is also great here. So all of these together are, are useful. You can do most of these at home, actually. You really don't have to go out um, and spend money to go to all, all kinds of fancy things. But um, again, if your practitioner knows how to cater for your individual needs, um, they'll find a solution for you. Just a little bit on weight. You know, I think a lot of people get held up on that. To me, it's not about what you look like. Obviously, matters what you feel like, but inflammation is actually stored in fat cells. So um, that can lead to chronic disease later on. Um, if you have a healthy weight, you have better blood sugar management, which decreases your risk for diabetes, and you'll have more energy throughout the day if your blood sugar is a bit better regulated. Um, and like I said, storing toxins, hormonal issues, uh, so many um, issues are actually from inflammation and weight regulation really helps with that. Okay, so that was the gut section. Um, I look forward to your questions uh, in a little bit. Just a little brief um, introduction into hormones. And um, I've said here why you need to, uh, basically hormones need you to chill. Um, essentially, the adrenals are our stress centers. So the little glands on top of the kidneys and they need specific vitamins and minerals to function so that we can keep on functioning. So we need to make sure that we replenish those vitamins like vitamin B, C, um, certain amino acids, et cetera. Um, a lot of chronic fatigue cases, depression, chronic pain, anemia, autoimmune diseases are actually as a result of adrenal fatigue or adrenal stress um, and depleting your reservoir of nutrients. Um, and a lot of people walking around, um, specifically sort of mid cities and up, are actually deficient of thyroid hormone, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. And we sort of think we're going crazy. You know, maybe you're feeling a bit irritable or you've got a very heavy cycle or um, you've suddenly been diagnosed with osteoporosis and you think, oh, but you know, everyone else has it, so it's normal. It's actually not. Um, unfortunately, what happens is with chronic stress, the adrenal glands actually steal away from your healthy hormones in order to keep you going. So you're just decreasing your beneficial hormones such as estrogen and testosterone at the cost of your um, youth and the youth of your and the health of your organs and your systems. So it can lead to premature aging. I don't just mean physically, um, I mean on the inside as well. All right, so let's quickly go through some tools. Um, I'm just going to ask that someone sends me a WhatsApp when my time is up. I see we're already just past eight o'clock. Um, let's quickly go through these. So giving you permission to relax to the max. Okay, so what that means is daily time to chill out. It is absolutely vital. It is a prescription in order to restore your energy levels and reset your mind and your heart and your nervous system and your gut and everything else. So prioritizing sleep is absolutely vital. So getting into bed nice and early, everyone pretty much needs eight hours, even if you tell yourself otherwise. Um, stay off of your devices before you go to bed, very important. Um, and yeah, I think just a good wind down time before you go to bed and try not to eat for at least two hours before you go to sleep. Um, Meditation, you know, a lot of people say, no, I can't meditate, but it looks different for everyone. You know, some people have, some of my patients have taken up um, doodling or, you know, just sort of scribbling on a page before um, they start their day. Or some people write random rap poetry. You know, it really can look any way that you want it to look, but essentially it's just a downtime where you're not thinking about your to-do list. Breathing exercises we've talked about, I'll give you a couple of links um, for, for some videos uh, that you can follow. 
Me time, so time away from other people. We do need people, um, but we also do need time to connect with ourselves. Um, so don't always, you know, reach for the phone and, you know, organize a party or a walk with friends um, when you're feeling lonely. Maybe just, um, I want to say first, really connect and see if you can maybe just spend some time on your own to connect and see what's going on for you. Journaling is very useful. Um, nature is the ultimate healer. So getting outdoors as often as possible. I think we all share that passion. Um, the ability of nature to reset our nervous systems has been well documented. So it's a combination of the green, the fresh air, um, you know, so many different things. And I'm sure you all know exactly what I'm talking about. And then have fun <laughs> in a healthy way. Um, don't get to a point where you have to de-stress using excessive amounts of alcohol or Netflix binge sessions or, you know, try and regulate yourself on a daily basis so that you can actually um, have energy to maybe go canoeing on, on the river close by or, you know, walk on the, uh, the new cliff path like we've got here in Arwanas. Okay, so we're getting outdoors. Invest in self-care. So here's a list of some supplements. I'm not going to go through all of these, but there is a list here. Um, it's, I think, what a lot of people are aware of, thanks to COVID, a lot of people are doing vitamin D. Just take, check the dosage. It must be a nice high dosage. Vitamin C. Omega is great. If you can't um, access fish, um, that's of good quality. Probiotics. Again, I prefer if you did it with fermented foods, but there are other options. Um, B vitamins, very, very important for stress. A B, good B complex, um, preferably an injection or under the tongue, so sublingual. Um, those supplements are great. And B12, um, bioidentical hormones. So these are just some extra goodies that us um, integrative medical doctors use. Um, bioidentical hormones, we do natural thyroid support um, and adrenal support. We use a lot of adaptogenic herbs, which help regulate the cortisol and the adrenaline in the body. Um, and then we can also do intravenous vitamin drips. I'm sure some of you might've heard about that. Um, and ozone therapy is also wonderful. Um, so if you do have an integrative uh, practitioner close by, you can maybe Google and I'll, I'll send a link as well for SASM. I see, I actually didn't include that in here. Um, where you can find a practitioner like myself close to you. Um, or you can maybe book a consult with me. I do Zoom consults as well if anyone has any further questions. So just to wrap up, prevention is always better than cure. Um, it's a bit of a self-intervention at the end of the day. You know, you need to sit with yourself and really check in and see where you are at. Are you feeling optimal? Is there anything that you could be doing to support yourself better, to be the best possible version of yourself in this one life that you've got. Some apps that we have of the Vimpof app, Headspace, Inside Timer, these are just available on your app store, on your uh, sort of smart device. Um, these are my two favorite um, podcasts, The Doctor's Kitchen, Doctor's Pharmacy. Um, and then you are welcome to go onto my website. There's a lot of uh, amazing educational material. Um, that you can access. Thank you, everybody. So as usual, you can use the reaction tools at the bottom of the screen to ask your questions. And if you are shy, that's not for Marty, then you can ask your questions in the chat. I saw Marty there in front of the elephant. I'm waiting for your questions, Marty. Um, I'm sure you're going to ask something. Oh, there we go. <laughs> you're welcome to unmute and ask your question. So um, the, the first one is, how do you eat an elephant? <laughs> That's just a joke. <laughs> no, th Thank thanks. you. Thanks. <laughs> thanks, Julian, uh, for the talk. It was uh, very interesting. I did uh, put it in the chat. <clears throat> I think I heard you say not too many raw veggies, and I was quite surprised by that comment. So I was just wanting maybe some further elaboration um, on that because, you know, the, the raw broccoli and cauliflower and all those sorts of things, raw beans, seem to be good things, but um, I'd be interested to hear what you have to say. 
Yeah, I think that's a really great question. Um, it's It depends on the individuals is usually how I start my answer. <laughs> Not necessarily for everyone, but if you've got any digestive issues, often the stress that raw vegetables puts on the digestive system um, in terms of undigested fiber. So the, the pancreas has to work so much harder to secrete um, extra digestive enzymes to break down the cellulose in the raw vegetables. So if you're cooking your veggies, even lightly steaming them, you're getting most of the nutritional benefit, but you're not actually putting that pressure on your system. Because they, they always used to say, kind of, if you boiling your vegetables, all the water goes, all the good mm -hmm. stuff goes in the water and down the drain, and you're eating the. Yeah, I think certainly you need to be, um, you need to know how to cook. And so I'll teach my patients as well. Steaming sort of in a tiny little bit of water just for two minutes where you're retaining all of the nutritional value um, and then cooking your veggies in like a one, one pot wonder, I call them, um, where it's like a stir fry where everything and all the juices and everything make part of the sauce. And so you're getting all of those minerals and nutrients. Um, and then there's another interesting sort of point on lectins um, which are in the skins of a lot of vegetables and beans and things um, which can be quite harmful specifically for certain autoimmune disorders and things so yeah all in all definitely you can have some raw veggies but I don't recommend for people I think it's just a common misconception like I have to go all raw and all vegan and all that sort of thing it's about balance at the end of the day. Cool I see there's another hand up so I'll go and wait with my next questions. Thank you for your patience, Marty. Um, Tom, please go ahead and ask your question. Uh, hello again, everybody. Um, doctor, I have one question. Um, so if you follow a healthy diet and all of a sudden you start craving for sugar, like chocolate, can this be a symptom of linkage? Thanks, Tom. Yeah, that's uh, actually something that happens quite commonly. I'm so glad that you asked that question. Um, Sugar cravings are often a can, can be a sign of or a symptom of gut disruption. So the microbiome, in fact, is being starved all of a sudden of um, a lot of the, let's say, uh, processed sugars and carbs that it's used to. So let's call those the sort of bad gut bugs that are used to getting their fix. And then suddenly you're cutting out a lot of those um, processed sugars and they start to have these cravings. And so it's actually, I, I tell my patients, it's not you, it's the gut bugs. <laughs> They're having the sugar cravings because they thrive like your candida, your, um, there's so many, but your yeasts specifically, they thrive on sugars. So it can be that, it can also be that your liver isn't necessarily functioning well. So all of those fall under the umbrella of leaky gut because leaky gut is a symptom of microbiome disruption. Um, so yeah, in short, to answer your question, definitely it can be a symptom. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, Rebecca, please go ahead and ask your question. Um, good evening, everyone. So I wanted to ask, cause there are some of us, the way we deal with stress, we binge, it's on very sugary stuff like ice cream and chocolate. Like what is the impact of those things on the stress that we are actually facing and trying to get rid of? Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's a very, um, it's a very real question. Um, I don't know anyone actually who doesn't do, do that at some point or in some form or another, but the, the impact in short is that again, it's feeding your bad gut bugs. So all of the good work that you were maybe doing in the day before trying to eat healthy and well, you can quickly undo by overdoing certain junk foods. Um, the sugar is very uh, sort of pro-inflammatory, so it can cause a lot of inflammation and it literally causes those holes in your gut to just get bigger and bigger. Specifically, if you're combining like dairy with sugar in excess. So it's not to say that you can never have these foods. Um, and it's also, Chris, you know, it's not to say that you can never have coffee or alcohol. It's just for certain periods of a year to do a little bit of a break so that you can have your yummy foods. You know, I, I call it the 80-20 rule. So once you've done sort of a protocol with a, a practitioner like myself, you actually don't have cravings anymore. 
it's the weirdest thing. Patients say, but I'm not even craving like binge eating chocolates anymore. Because um, you're getting so much more in, in connection with your intuition, the intuition of your body. That's very powerful. I hope that answers. Thank you, Anne. While we're looking for more questions, lovely comment by Andy Klee. Great talk. Thank you. Heard a great quote recently. Rest is resistance. Got to stay healthy for the long fight. Thanks, Andy. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you want to see mine? <laughs> Johan, anybody else coming in for a question? I don't see any specific questions in the uh, in the chat. I'm going through it now. I see Andy Sanders up, so he can ask a question. There we go. Yeah, I'll keep my shirt on. Don't panic. Um, thank you so <laughs> much, Julian. I really in enjoyed that talk. Um, you know, I had chronic fatigue syndrome or, or ME 10 or so years ago when I was in quite a stressful job with the forces, but that's, that's another story. Um, one of the causes of stress, which probably quite a few of us in this audience suffer from, is the overwhelming state of the environment and the problems, the sheer size of the problems we're facing. And have you got any thoughts? And I'm, I'm sort of thinking the answer may lie somewhere in some of the sort of Eastern philosophies, as well as the Eastern um, movement practices like yoga and Tai Chi and things, um, of really how we can prevent those factors and stresses becoming so overwhelming and how we deal with them um, so that we can kind of perhaps use the fear or anxiety to actually give us more energy to, to deal with them. Um, I hope that makes sense because it's I find it really difficult to sort of take a time out for 10 minutes or something like that. And then I've done my walk. And as I'm walking back home, I'm thinking, well, it's still all there and I've still got to try and deal with it. Anyway, enough wittering on. I think you, you get it. Sure. I think that's something that a lot of us do struggle with. Um, I can imagine specifically um, you guys sort of on the front lines of this overwhelming, uh, just like it is a, an, an emergency of sorts, you know, for our planet. And um, what I usually, I think my answer to that would be, you can only pour from a full cup. You can, you know, it's, it's sort of like the teacup theory where um, the cup spills over onto the saucer, spills over onto the table, spills over onto the floor. And it can only, you can only influence your community. You know, it starts with yourself, your family, your community in the world. If you are actually taking care of your health. So that's 10 minutes that you're spending to sort of reset your nervous system. Um, firstly, it actually enhances your productivity and your creativity um, and your just general brain function, etc. And it means that you'll have a sustainable kind of um, uh, trajectory uh, to be able to help the plant for longer because you'll be around for longer. <laughs> you know, so taking out that time to really do some food prep to think about what you are having for lunch or dinner and journal, journal a little bit about, you know, I don't know, do something creative. It might seem like a waste of time because you could be saving the world and saving the planet. And, you know, I suffer with the same thing in terms of my passion with healthcare and the state of the world. But, you know, I've burnt out many times in my life and it doesn't help anybody when you're so flat, I'm sure you can relate. <laughs> And so it's literally just that one step in front of the other and you have to you have to put yourself first. John, after Roland Goods, I'm gonna uh, respond to the uh, well, I'm going to ask uh, Julian to respond to the question that's in the chat, but over to you and Roland Goods. Uh, good evening, Dr. Fenwick. Uh, thank you very much. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm a game ranger in Angola. And a lot of my uh, anti-poaching guys are Paraquena San. And one of the things that, I mean, obviously herbal medicine is important, but one of the most important is devil's claw. Now, perhaps you could give me, if you know more about devil's claw, because I've tried to find out more about it, and I really haven't. So perhaps you could tell me about devil's claw, which these guys really swear by. Sure, that's a good one. Um, I know it is sort of a very common herb around and it's actually in a lot of the tinctures that I use um, for um, detox support. So it's got many, many variable functions. I'm certainly not an indigenous medicine herbal, herbalist or herbal um, sort of uh, expert, but 
it helps to um, yeah, so boost detox, so mobilize toxins from the organs, actually quite potently, and you have to be quite careful on how you dose it, because um, it, can, it can cause quite a severe detox reaction if you overdo it. Um, it also kills a lot of um, parasites and worms, um, I'm told, usually in combination with like your African wormwood and those types of preparations. Um, and I think it, it also has um, a very good immune boosting quality. Um, but that's about the full extent. That's how I use it in my practice. I'm not sure if you have anything extra maybe to teach me. No, Doctor, thank you very much. Yes. No, only that they swear they have a cup of the of the uh, devil's claw tea every morning. And uh, I want to know about it. But yes, thank you very much. Uh, you've explained a lot. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Roland. Just a question in the chat coming from Christine Ampumuza. Thank you for the great talk. Do juices from a raw from raw veggies also exist stress on the system? just like eating uh, the rolls. Ah, thank you for bringing that up. I actually forgot to mention that. So um, in short, it definitely does not put the same amount of strain on the body um, because it doesn't actually, you know, you withhold a lot of the fiber. So that's why we juice because you can't physically eat 20 carrots or, you know, um, two bunches of celery or three cucumbers or whatever it is. So juicing usually forms part of a, um, specific detox regime. I also don't advise to overdo it because you can actually overdose on suits and minerals and things. So, um, but yeah, it certainly doesn't have as much fiber, but it can put pressure on the body in other ways. So just be careful um, and don't add too much fruit. So I usually say just veggies. No, you know, because usually the, the juices that you buy so many apples go in there and lots of fructose and oranges and things. I see there's a question about meal plans. Thank you very much. Um, Julian, if you want to go for that question and then we can go to Himansu. Sure, so yeah, there are meal plans. I usually, again, um, recommend them specifically for what you might need. Um, it really depends on the person, what, what you're gonna do. Generally, if you do about a three to 400 milliliter juice every day with your normal meals. Um, so like, let's say before breakfast or even as a breakfast, um, that could be very detoxifying for your body already. And then you add to that like some herbal teas throughout the day, that could be, that could be awesome. Thank you, Himansu, please go ahead and ask your question. Hi, uh, Dr. Fenwick, can, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, look, I've, I probably have a leaky, a leaky gut, as you call it, uh, has been with me all my life, I guess. But one of the things you mentioned I find quite interesting is to uh, sort of change wheat-based products, say, by rice. Uh, you think, I mean, I'm not really a rice consumer as such, but uh, I, I only gobble wheaty things, you know, bread and chapatis and all that sort of stuff. But maybe I'm doing it wrong because it's, it's, it's in inverted commas, an ailment I've had from since I've been a kid and I'm still living with it and fighting it and battling with it and... Uh, you know, trying to get over it. And when it knocks me out, I just get around the corner and overtake it. <laughs> sort of just, just a battle all the time. And I think one of the issues that's really, in a sense, uh, probably ex exacerbates the situation for me is, is stress. Uh, because I handle a dozen and one things at the same time with students and researchers and collaborators and all that sort of thing. But Maybe, you know, maybe the wheat issue could be my problem. I don't know. It certainly sounds that way. Um, I think the best advice I can give you from distance is um, to try and cut it out for three, four, five weeks and see if it makes a difference. I know specific uh, meals are difficult to replace, but you could use instead of normal gluten, 
poisonous flower, you could use chickpea flower, tapioca flower, um, there's a whole host of different um, sort of brown rice flour, etc. And there's gluten-free mixes that you can also make um, all kinds of different foods. Um, I often do cooking workshops with my patients as well. So we do a lot of favorites. So our last workshop was actually sort of Ayurvedic, so curries, and we had gluten-free naans and rutis. And, you know, so, so there are recipes online that you can Google and just try out. Um, yeah, see, see, see what your gut tells you. Literally, will Yeah, many thanks. You're welcome. Professor Romancio, I think you need to visit us in Hermanus and come for a consultation. I'd be happy to help. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Cheryl, please go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Dr. Fenwick. I just want to find out about cinnamon, ginger, and garlic. Yes, How yes. Are they three? To me, that to me they're superfoods. Um, and I just need you to verify that because I've heard such good stuff about cinnamon and ginger. And of course, down at Tindumu, we chow garlic. We are praying that it keeps the mosquitoes away, but I'm sure um, I've learned it's also a, a antibiotic. So, Absolutely. No, those are fantastic. I think, um, you know, cinnamon is good for blood sugar regulation, can help with weight management. Um, most of my diabetics, they put cinnamon in everything. And even just in normal... Um, I think you can even add it to your coffee. It helps you actually not have that crash from sugar. So, you know, some people do it in teas, on their oats. I, I would just put it in everything, really. Um, it's also local anesthetic. So if you are in the bush or something and you've got a cinnamon quill and you've got a toothache or something, you can rub it on there or on the skin for a bite. Um, ginger, massive anti-inflammatory benefits stimulates the gut, helps uh, the breakdown of food, so maximizes absorption of food, and obviously just very um, immune boosting, so we all have ginger tea when we're sick. Um, and then garlic, yeah, garlic is anti-everything, antiviral, antibacterial, anti-cancer, anti-parasitic. I wouldn't have it um, before you go to bed because it's very stimulating, it can keep you up, so just be careful. Um, and also to avoid before a date. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, thank you. And then, just sorry, and then beetroot, um, that's just another one? Raw yeah, or cooked? Okay. It doesn't matter. Yes, just peel. Just peel the beetroot. Yes. Um, okay. Yeah, raw, raw or cooked is fine. All right, because those are the four that I've got the community on. So, and fennel. Yes, amazing. That's okay. super. Excellent. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And fennel is good. Yeah, fennel is also digestive. Um, yeah, very soothing for the gut. Um, very anti-inflammatory as well. Um, fennel tea is very calming for the nerves. Okay. So right. anxiety and things like that. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent. Um, Julian, I've received a anonymous WhatsApp question. Um, why do people that have sometimes conquered one addiction then suffer from another addiction? Like you move away from alcohol, then you suffer from sugar addiction. Mm. Is there a... Yeah, I think that's, that's a really deep question, actually. Um, what's coming up for me is that addiction is a symptom of something deeper. So it's sort of a void within yourself that you know you're trying to fill with a substance or with a behavior and if you haven't gotten to the root cause of what caused that hole within yourself um you know it, it could be something from childhood it could also be just how you are responding to stress once again so when your nervous system is in that sort of tight fight or flight state from a very young age you never actually learn to deal with stress so you need those dopamine fixes like sugar, massive dopamine rush, alcohol, you know, other drugs, etc., cannabis or whatever. Um, you know, so it, those things used in excess once again. That's that's a problem. And if you don't get to the bottom of why you can't learn to be at peace or unwind, 
it's, it's a tough one. So I usually refer my patients to like a really good therapist um, to get to the bottom of that, yeah, as a team. Thank you very much. Um, Barent from TUT is asking, I consume cancer bush on a daily basis for various purposes, such as sleeping and detox. Is it, a good, is it as good as it has been made out to be? Cancer bush is great. Well done if you can stomach it. <laughs> it's like so bitter. Um, I would probably take a break from it. Um, it can also be very detoxing, so it can put uh, pressure on your kidneys and your liver. Um, it, it is a fantastic bush. Once again, it, it, it is literally used for like a hundred different things, including preventing cancer, immune boosting, detox, etc. Digestion, I mean, you name it. But I think maybe do it like two or three days a week. I wouldn't do it more, unless you do have an active disease that you're trying to manage. Okay, but thank you very much. Great. Chris, am I missing any questions at the moment? Yeah, you'd missed Marty's question. He just wouldn't put up his hand. Marty, where are you? <laughs> he said he's got another question. So let's uh, give him a question. And then if there's no more questions, then uh, we call it a night. As usual, I might be being a bit controversial, but uh, I mean, the whole COVID and <clears throat> vaccinations and the long-term effects on that on your body. I don't know if you have a view on that without going down a crazy rabbit hole. <laughs> oh, I knew someone was going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think any, any foreign substance that you're putting in your body can have um, good and bad effects. Um, I just told my patients um, who opted for the vaccination that you need to optimize your health anyway. You can't rely on a jab coming from the external um, to actually know your body well enough to protect you from you know, a potentially deadly virus. Your health needs to protect you. It's not a quick fix, so that's my little tangent. But to answer your question, um, certainly high doses of vitamin C, vitamin D, so your anti-inflammatory immune supporting um, and you can get those from natural, you know, just from eating well as well. But I think now more than ever, we really need to start prioritizing our health. And if, if we are sort of going to reach a point where we're going to be forced to do these things to our bodies, we have to be in the best possible shape that we can be. And then the, the other question that I wanted to ask is, <clears throat> you haven't really mentioned it, and I'm pretty, oh, well, I, I know I'm guilty of it. I mean, I, I don't eat meals every single day all day you know i typically eat dinner and that's the only meal i eat today i mean how bad is it for me i mean there, there are these other and it's i haven't i've always done that <clears throat> kind of my whole life but um there's also these other you know fasting and that sort of stuff that that, that people talk about i mean well, i would be interested in your your sort of views on it so intermittent fasting has actually been proven to be quite detrimental if you've got sort of adrenal fatigue. I mean, it is really great for autophagy, which is the breaking down of negative, um, I want to say, detrimental cells in the body. Great for energy, great for weight management. But if you're already in a state of stress chronically and then you're starving yourself for so many hours of the day, your body is going to think that you are in a war zone or in a, you know, in a drought. And so it really does place a lot of stress on the body. Um, so it's not for everyone. And specifically, if we're talking about, if you're suffering from chronic stress, I would say, try and eat your three meals a day. It um, doesn't have to be three big meals. It can just be like, a, like I said, something um, invigorating in the morning with your greens, preferably, um, or like a soak, soaked overnight oats or something like that. A small snack, even if it's like a cup of bone broth or something in the day, a handful of nuts, and then your your dinner should preferably not be your main meal of the day. No, no, it's not good. Um, what, what would the detrimental effect be that should be noticeable of, of doing that sort of intermittent fasting? Um, what, what should I notice if it's a problem? Because I mean, so, I, I, yeah. I generally don't feel bad. I mean, I have other things. Um, again, we we'll probably have another chat another time, but. Um. <laughs> I don't think you necessarily notice the difference. It will pop up with other sort of small little symptoms that were seemingly unrelated, if I can put it that way, because it's just going to cause pressure on your 
adrenals, pressure on your gut, um, and so your inflammation might increase. So you might get all kinds of other, you know, that whole list of chronic diseases I mentioned. So it's not necessarily noticeable. In fact, you might sort of feel really great, but it's not the most responsible thing for your body if you have chronic stress. I'm assuming you do in your line of work. <laughs> not, not Marty, no. And the symptoms he will show is his teeth will grow as long as the elephant behind him. <laughs> Marty, you eat the elephant one bite at a time, not one, yeah. din one dinner at a time. <laughs> it's one elephant at a time. I mean, I, I can't, I've got an appetite. <laughs> so, so, I mean, I, th I think that's the other thing. Like, in the mornings, I generally don't feel hungry. But, uh, yeah, we, we, that, that's why, you know, you eat when you're hungry is kind of the thing that you, you get told. Yeah. And if you're too busy to yeah. eat, then you're too busy to eat. But did someone else ask another question? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Marty. The last question, there's a question in the chat. Can laxatives reduce the effects of binge eating sugars? I say, uh, yeah, can laxatives reduce the effects of binge eating sugars? So I would be very careful of using laxatives as a, a kind of a fix for uh, unhealthy eating behaviors. And they can cause severe damage to your gut. And they can also worsen leaky gut. So you might think that you're preventing yourself from gaining weight. Um, but in actual fact, your body already absorbs the sugar almost instantly. When it, goes, when it hits your stomach, it gets absorbed pretty much. And then your blood sugar spikes. And that causes a lot of different um, inflammatory responses in the body. So that can cause the gut to leak, can cause the brain to leak. So you can end up having a lot of trouble sleeping with mood, concentration, etc. cetera. Um, so it's not just about fat and binge eating. And I think a lot of people have that connotation. There's actually a lot of other detrimental effects. Um, so I, I find breathing exercises, oh, it's, sorry, it's my battery. Um, breathing exercises, when you're feeling a craving coming on, do a breathing exercise, Google the Wim Hof breathing for beginners and actually do that breathing exercise and sit with your body just for two minutes before you reach out and you know reach for the cookies or the ice cream or whatever and even if you still eat the cookies and the ice cream just notice the difference in the conversation that's going on in your head and and see if you're being very hard on yourself and ask yourself why are you being so hard on yourself you know um, just that shift in conversation can actually the next time you reach out for the ice cream, you'll be like, actually, maybe I'm just going to have one or two bites. And the next time, you're not even going to reach out for the ice cream. So, you know, it's a process. It's Thank a you very much. Yeah. Johan, do you see any last questions? Mm, nothing at the moment, Chris. Well, we don't. This is almost two hours. Yep. Uh, Andy Klee, we need to meet each other at some time. I'll go on a diet and then we can check out <laughs> who's the fittest. <laughs> Come and anyway, yoga class with me, Chris. <laughs> we have to, I have to stay at the back away from the mirrors, but they're doing me some good, I think. <laughs> but no, we, okay. yeah, we've got to, yeah, we'll need and to you're listening? back to Africa one more time, I think. So yeah, we'll, we need to make a plan, definitely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, looking forward to doing that. That'd be good. Thank you. Lovely to have everybody on tonight. Um, we look forward to next week's talk also, a little bit also on their health and uh, more the emotional and psychological health. So uh, especially those of you who, uh, who are working with and know of people who have some form of eco-anxiety, please encourage them to join. And then we're back to our normal uh, talks uh, on the um, sort of the conservation side of things. This was a conservation talk with, uh, of a difference, meaning that we have to conserve ourselves and uh, that's in our hands. Uh, Dr. Julian Fenwick, thank you so much for your time, for your trouble, for you being a professional person, sharing your knowledge with us so freely and uh, making a difference. We can reason and argue as much as we want to. Deep down, each of we, us know we have to stop eating at night uh, uh, only. We have to eat in the morning also, Marty. <laughs> and we, we, we know what we have to stop doing. And I know I don't have to stop drinking coffee, uh, but uh, yeah, we know. know. <laughs> um, 
Thank you. And thanks for the forum and for creating this amazing opportunity for just learning and community. It's so valuable. So it's been a real privilege. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. And to all of you, wishing you a good evening, good morning for those of you who are in the morning and uh, good health, which uh, is in our hands and not in the doctor's hands. <laughs>